So Vincent, I yes. think we should start off the podcast by you telling a story that you've never told uh, before, which is we were, it was one of the most important nights of your life. We were going to the Emmy Awards and it was, a, it was a very big night for you. And someone did something horrible who's never to this day been found. And I think you should tell the story here for the first time ever. You mean the night we were up in the Hollywood Hills at a, at a, at a club? Yeah, okay. the whole. All right. Whole thing. I was. OK, so I had. No, 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 no. Not that. Then when you were getting ready to go to the Emmys. Welcome to the podcast, by the way. Oh, God. OK, good. No problem. So we're at the Peninsula Hotel in a suite. And um, so I was getting ready. Maureen was getting ready. I was ready. I had my tuxedo on already. I'm, I'm all set to go. I'm just hanging around in the living room of the suite. And the doorbell rings. So I went. I said, hello, 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 nothing. I open up the door. There's no one there. But on the outside handle of the door is a shopping bag. And I look in the shopping bag and there's a whole big deluxe size thing of depends. <laughs> so I look down the hallway. Sure enough, who's scampering down the hallway? <laughs> Little Robert. <laughs> because he's got a very warped sense of humor. We all know that. And uh, it was him. So he set the tone for the rest of the night. But he paid <laughs> for it because I bit his head three or four times in public. I have actually never knew that story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It depends. Um, um, well, you know, it's a long night. Long it was night. a big long night. night. It was a long night. The big other. Night uh, huh? I said it was a big night for you and I didn't want you to embarrass yourself. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I still have the uh, tuxedo, by the way. It's still dry, Robert. No <laughs> well done. <laughs> um. You what guys have the, always had a very special relationship. Yes. No, Robert is, uh, Robert is, uh, he's symbiotic. He really is. Mm -hmm. We hit it off right away. And I mean, you know, we're uh, miles apart in age, but it make any, I always got a kick out of him. I always pictured him as, uh, you know, the cartoon um, with the road runner. Sure. And I'm the road runner and I'm always going after him. You know, I just like, I, I almost <laughs> try, I don't get him. I'm close to getting him. It never worked out all these years. But, you know, just because you're 3,000 miles away, I have a friend with a plane, Robert, so don't, don't aggravate. Mm, <laughs> always good to have a friend with a plane. Always. <laughs> so you, what happened was Vince told me uh, he was very upset that he hasn't been on pajama pants. He said that his wife walked in on him watching YouTube with a tear in his eye. Is that yes. what happened, Vince? I was, I was, I was hurt, Robert, because <laughs> prior to, the, to your podcast, and congratulations with it, certainly. Prior to you kicking it off, we had spoken, and you said, "No, no, 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 Jamie and I, we get, and we're going to have you on right away, and you and, and you're going to be on the show, and you and you lied, Robert. <laughs> so it took me to call you last week to remind you. So what? And what Vin said was when he said he would bite my head, we would yeah. be like in the middle of you know on like the red carpet at the Emmy Awards, and he would come over to me and put his head over my head and bite down. <laughs> on my head, like really, really hard. And he would just look just like he's laughing right now. He would just stand there and laugh and he thought it was amazing. One night he had gel in his hair, Jamie. He had <laughs> gel in his hair and I went to go bite his head and I wound up with this mouthful of, I don't know what the hell it was, but it cracked. I, I felt it crack, you know, <laughs> gel gets dry. And then when you touch it, it cracks. Sure. So I had a crack when I, when I bit him in the head. Oof. That but was, uh, I mean, we've, you know, I've, I've tried many times to get along with this little whatever. But he was on drugs. Oh, it's not your fault. fault. No, it's not my fault. He is. No, no, he, he's like a little Irish <laughs> imp, you know, he's very <laughs> mischievous, extremely mischievous. But that's OK, because, you know, I married an Irish girl and so I kind of get it. <laughs> and you've how long have you guys been married? This August, it'll be 38 years. Oh, that's oh, wow. wonderful. Long time. We met, we met um, maybe about eight or nine months before and then just decided to get married. And then, that was it. You guys are one of those couples where you just look and you're like, that's, that's soulmates. Those are like, 
it's very clear that you love each other, but it's also very clear that you like each other. And I always think that that's a very beautiful thing to see that's and the, rare. That's the, yeah, that's the element, Jamie. That's yeah. The and, and, that's the, and it changes, you know, it changes over time. There are different degrees of it. You, I'll never forget a piece of advice you gave me once. Um, you were telling me something about a wedding ring. Do you remember this? And you're like, you said something, I'm going to botch it, but it was something about the wedding ring and it's, and it's a circle because it's, it's just, it's always changing and you're going to go through cycles and you're going to think right. that that's like what right. it symbolizes. And it was, you're I always right. thought that was really beautiful. I remember that. And I, yeah. And I, yeah, I do remember that. And that's what it is. It's never yeah. ending, but you know, there are different sides of it and it turns around and, mm -hmm. and there you are. But you know, many kudos to you because you have found your, your happiness and God bless you for that. Thank you. And Thank your children, you. Your husband, so. It took a minute. Yeah. I'm the rest there. of us are still looking. <laughs> well, uh, Rob's not looking. No, 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 he doesn't look. No, he waits for things to happen in front of him. You know, then maybe it's going to be up. like one Postmate delivery girl. They're going to be yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's she it. is. it's going to be that quick, Robert. My brain will think that she made the food and I'll fall in love with her. What brain? Be right. Oh, favorite. the brain. Yeah, the brain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what about the night we were in the Hollywood Hills in a club? You remember? Tell me this story because I probably. Oh, man. I was Jamie. I was doing a movie called Fun with Dick and Jane, the remake. I was playing uh, Drew Carey's father in law. Okay? OK, so they had me out there for a week, a few weeks before. I thought it was. Wasn't it Jim Carrey? What I say? Drew, Drew Carey. Carey. Sorry, guys. Very different. Jim he's Carey. not different. all there, guys. He's little, you know, just give him some time. He's, he's okay. I was actually sitting here being like, oh, was Drew Carey in that movie too? <laughs> That's fine. So they had me out there about a week, I, I don't know, about a month before for a week. Then they flew me home, flew me back. So the entire week before those, the Emmy Awards, whatever year that was, was so we were waiting. We were waiting for Maureen to fly in to come and meet me so she could be with me at the Emmys. And then so Robert and I, for some reason, got into a very expensive cab <laughs> from the Peninsula Hotel and went up to some club all the way up in the hills. I mean, you needed oxygen. We were so high up somewhere. It was some a club or a party? A club. No, we, a club. Went to a, we went to a club. I don't Even remember else? the name of it. I don't think I ever did know the name of it anyway. So we go in. The place is packed. And I, you know, it, that's not my thing. You know, I just, I want to go have a drink and whatever and just relax. So we're hanging out a little bit and Tara Reed was there. Okay. And all I saw peripherally was she locked eyes onto Robert like he was a Thanksgiving turkey. Okay. She's just giving him one of these, you know, the whole bit. I said, Robert, I think we should get out of here. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's too crowded. Let's go. So we go past Paris Hilton with her big Samoan bodyguard. You remember that? She was there. Finally, I got him out. We get back into another very expensive taxi cab to go back to the peninsula. So now by the time we get there, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe about quarter to one in the morning. And we sit down in the lounge at the peninsula bar. And we have a drink. So we're done. You know, it's time to go upstairs and get some rest. A waitress walks over with a, with a tab. We only had one drink each. It was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I think I remember $1,200. Something like that. Yeah, it, right. I guess there were other cast members, Jamie. They were drinking, and they said, well, you know what? Let's go home. Let's go back to the room, whatever. Nobody bothered to ask for their tabs, of course. So we get the tab. So I didn't miss a beat. I had the pen in my hand to sign it. I said, Robert, is Landris two S's? He said, yeah. <laughs> so I wrote, I, Landris, boom, producer from the Spons. Yeah, and so we left people, a pretty good tip, too. Eileen <laughs> left a pretty good tip. For people, who don't, know, tip. For people who don't know, Eileen Landris was a producer on The Sopranos. And what happened was we had been drinking at the bar at like 10 with everybody. We left, went to the club, we hung out, we came back, and they just thought we had never left. So they gave us the, the check, like, oh, here you go. And he just turned right to me. He goes, how many S's are in Landris? It was, I couldn't. Yeah. Oh. 
<laughs> it so was such slick. So cool. It was, it was cool. like, no, Jamie, it was seamless. It was just like two S's and that. Yeah, boom. And we it was a star. Seamless. That has three S's. <laughs> so what was it? What was it like working with uh, Jim Carrey? Not Jim wonderful Carrey. Guy. Jim Carrey. Jim no, Carrey. wonderful guy. He um, my first my first morning on the set when he came in, uh, we were in Hancock Park in some location, some house, um, the house that my character owned. And he came right up to me, and I swear to God, he took me off base. He started telling me. Johnny Sachs dialogue from different scenes. And I'm saying, what kind of a memory do you have? My God. We were like in yeah, fourth season by then, whatever it was. This guy just kept rattling off Johnny Sachs dialogue. It's eight o'clock in the morning. I never met the guy before. He was wonderful, though. He really was. He was a very giving guy. You want another take? Let's do it. You want this? Let's do it. He was great. I played Taya Leone's father. I said, Taya, I'm 12 years older than you are. I must have had one hell of a child to have got me playing your father. Hollywood. Yeah, Hollywood, right? Movies. Movies. I met Jim Carrey a handful of times. The first time I ever met him, I remember, first of all, him being the nicest guy. But I, yes, he loved Sopranos, and he yes, was talking a lot exactly about right. it. Yeah. Exactly right. No, it was great. Cool. So, Robert, when are you going to get married? I don't know. This is this I is. Know. I was I was a germaphobe before. It's just going to be worse after this. I think you know. Can you tell Rob's got a little bit of sun on his cheeks? Yeah, I know. I heard this. He went to visit you. You want to see? We were we were out in the sun for I don't know a couple hours. He yeah. started the day looking like like raw chicken breast or something. <laughs> so. He's Irish. That's white. fine. They they can't stay out in the sun. My wife goes out to get the mail at the end of the drive, and she comes back. You got to put salve on her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was uh, it was a lot of forehead peeling. I got I got a lot of sun too. But we, you know, you're you're not out in the sun for three months, and then you go mm -hmm. out for an hour, yeah. and yeah, it, yeah, it might as well you might as well have just been at the beach all day. Exactly. Exactly. Was it worth it, Robert? Did you did you feel that? that helped you your mood and or Listen, would would you I, never I, I, want to go out there again because i was uh, i told joey i was on the phone with joey joe perino who's been on here uh two nights ago and i was telling him what happened so i hadn't i had left my apartment once in three months so i've cast him's like listen i'll come pick you up come to the beach we'll hang out i'm like all right he's a guy i got a new house come see the new house I'm like okay we get in the car we drive down to the beach uh we're, we're by his house for maybe 10 minutes. He's like, you want to come see on the top floor? There's a deck. And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Let's go up there. So we go up there. He sits down on the chair and he's ordering food. And I'm looking out on the beach. And I'm like, wow, I've been locked up for three months. I'm like, this is so amazing to be here with my buddy, to be looking out onto the beach. He's got a beautiful new house. And all of a sudden I look and I'm like, what is that? It looked like a like a rain cloud. It looked like a cloud coming at me eye level, like perfectly eye level. And I'm like, what is, and as soon as I realize what it is, I know why they call it hitting the deck. I hit the, it was a swarm of murder hornets. Like, no, a, a chasm. Well, How they were, long? they were bees. They were, <laughs> they were bees. Some say they were bees. I say, <laughs> I say murder hornets. It was chasm. So here's what happened. Uh, I hit the oh deck. my god! I hit the deck. I fall right to the floor. There, there's like so. Here's the lounge chair where Cassim is. He's sitting here. I hit the the deck right here, and I lay down. Cassim, God bless him. He's got a lot of talents, but I don't think vision is. You know, he's always got those glasses on. He uh -uh. he he goes. What is it? And he looks. And he's, <laughs> looking, he's looking right at it, and he's like, "What? Yeah. What's going on?" And I'm like, "Bam!" He like, grazed my nose. Yeah, I'm like, "It's a murder hornet." Finally, he sees them. He starts. To, he rolls over and turns. So now me and Casim are just locking eyes <laughs> for like 30 seconds while a swarm of what I say were murder hornets. Some say they were bees. Uh, flies over his head the entire time, and I'm looking at like six inches from Casim's face. I'm like, "This is how I go." Like I was inside. <laughs> I was inside for three months, and now it's just like, you know what? That's it for me. I'm. 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 And murder hornet is gonna kill you. 
Hey, uh, sorry to interrupt the show with Vince, um, but it's time for another sponsored ad read. And Manscaped.com is back. We're so happy to have them back as a sponsor. This time with a new product, and I can't help but think it's aimed directly at me. Um, it's called the Weed Whacker. It's a nose hair trimmer. And they must have got a look at my profile last episode because um, th- this this I'm taking a little more personally than the yeah. uh, Lawnmower 3.0. Well, they told us they were in the works with the weed whacker, but they first wanted us to do the the ball trimmer. And what happened was the weed whacker had a 60 minute battery life and they saw our uh, podcast and said, we need to make it 90 because otherwise Kasim is just going to get half a nostril. Look, I, I got, I got to say this, this one was a product right out of the box. Um, I didn't wait to charge. I didn't even read the instructions. I just turned on and shoved right in my nose and it's got this per, 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 it was like one of those. It it's was got like, proprietary skin safe technology. Why can't I say proprietary? I shoved it in my nose and I didn't worry about it snagging or nicking anything in my nose. Okay. Listen, it was like one of those missiles that has the tracking. It knows right where to go. You open up the box and it just. Whoop, it went whoop. right into my nose. Yeah. It's got right. a 9,000 RPM motor. It did all the work in there. You can shove it in your ear. It'll do the same thing. If you're like me, you get nose hairs and then they creep down into your mustache. And then they start, then your nose hair start pretending to be a mustache hair. And we know it's not. We know where you're from. And you can just shove it in there, take care of it. Eight out of 10 women think it's disgusting, by the way. Manscaped, Manscaped did that. They took a poll. Eight out of 10 women think nose hair is disgusting. But I think 10 out of 10 think it's disgusting if it goes from your nose into your mustache. I don't think any of them are liking that. No. And look, they'll send you a replacement uh, blade every three months to make sure that you're not uh, using old and dirty cartridges. So thanks to manscaped.com. Use promo code PJPANTS for 20% off your first order and free shipping and continue supporting the show. You guys want to know how to support Pajama Pants? Go to, go to manscaped.com and use promo code PJPANTS. That's how. And also, if your dad looks anything like our guest this week, you might want to get it for your dad. Father's Day is coming up. Promo code PJPANTS, 20% off, free shipping. I think that's it. We go back to Vince. Back to Vince. Yeah, it took me, it it definitely took me a second to realize what was happening because (laughs) all I saw, I was just looking, my phone was here and I was just looking at Rob. And then my, I look at Rob and Rob's doing this like, Oh, oh, and uh, and then I looked at Rob and I had to figure out what Rob was doing the thing. And then I had to react to what Rob was reacting to. And then I saw a couple bees and then I saw a massive cloud, a huge swarm of bees. I've never seen that before. I'm right. I've seen it a couple times, but it's never like beach? it's never a cool experience. It's always very scary. And it went <laughs> right over the top of our heads. And and then <laughs> and then I, I fell right on the floor. Me and Rob were like intimately close. And then we watched this swarm of bees just kind of go like north, you know, towards Santa Monica. And, um, and I was just explaining to him like all the problems the house has been having. Like there was a, last time we told you, there was like this huge water leak that we had. There's all this stuff that's fucked up and just needs repair. And then like minutes later, here's a swarm of bees. Like there's some, there's a force telling me that I made the wrong decision in buying this house. But, uh, there's a force telling, telling everyone there's a lot of fun. The Has Robert been in your house? My house? Yes. Or, yeah, in your house. Yeah. Has Robert been in your house? He, he's been in my house. So the house I live in now, he came, he walked through the house once because I have dogs. Yeah. So he walked through the house once and had to stay outside until he started getting red and puffy. And then at the new house, there aren't dogs there yet. So he came into that house. But even then, he started itching. And you know then, I mean? and then, like days before that, there had been our dogs there, but it had been days, but he somehow felt it. Could it be you, though? Could it be on you? I mean, it also could be me. Sometimes I have dog fur on me. I try and do a good job of lint rolling, but yeah, Jamie, I mean, that's, I could be the problem. We know you don't like them and probably touch them, but it could still get on you. <laughs> I wouldn't let Robert back into the house. I think he cursed it, God forbid. <laughs> yeah. Don't let him back in. Things have just been getting worse. You're a problem child, Robert. It's nothing new. Speaking of problems in his house, weren't you 
You were doing construction before you started acting? Yes, I owned a masonry business for many, many years, which I eventually gave to my son. And um, that's the reason I never wanted to go to my Sopranos audition because I was working, I was busy. And uh, I had a little agent at the time. She said, you know, there's this thing called Sopranos. I said, yeah. I said, I know Tony Sirico. He's already started filming it. He said, well, there's a part, this guy, Johnny Sack. And I said, you know, I, I no, no, I, I'm not going. I, I had no idea what this was going to be. Um, I was working, though, paying a detective on an NBC movie, a two-hour movie of the week called Exile. Chris Nolf, uh put me in it. He's, he was a friend of mine, and he was starring in it with, I don't remember who else. And so I was on Staten Island filming, which is a great distance from Manhattan, actually, which was one of my excuses for not going to the Sopranos audition. So she called me up. My agent called me up a couple of days later. I said, listen, the, the part's still up and you should really go in. And I was like in my 40s, whatever, at the time. And she said, well, the character's 70 years old. I said, well, what the hell do they want to see me for? No, 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 you should go, you should go. Okay. I got done on the set in Staten Island early, went back to New Jersey, put on different clothes, got into a cab, pull up on 79th Street for some strange reason. They were casting in a rented room. And uh, I get out of the cab. I was already 20 minutes late. And I said, you know, I'm tired of rushing around all day long. I'm going to stop. Let me light a cigarette. I'm going to smoke a cigarette on the sidewalk. And I'll go up in a little while. Well, one cigarette led to the second cigarette. Now I'm a good 45 to 50 minutes late. So finally I go upstairs and I go into this huge room. There's only one woman sitting at a table in the middle of the room. It was very eerie. And she didn't even lift up her head. She heard me walk in. And without looking at me, she said, well, you're late. Uh, she said, I'm done for the day. I'm going home. I said, good, no problem. Thank you. And I'm ready, I'm ready to leave. She looked up and she said, okay, wait a minute. Hold on. She said, uh, they faxed you the sides? I said, yeah, I have the sides. She said, sit down. Let's, le let's read this scene. And it was me brokering a deal between Hesh and Tony Soprano and whatever. So I read it, blah, blah, blah. And she said, all right, it's Thursday. I want you to come in Monday to Silver Cup Studios. I said, what the hell? What is Silver Cup Studios? What, what is it? Oh, it's in Queens, and you can't miss it. You go over to 59th Street. For me, I drive like, you know, if it's not two blocks away, I don't want to go. So I get to the I get to the call back. I get to the call back, and I'm in the waiting room. And I hear these guys going in and out, going in and out, reading for Johnny Sack. Same dialogue. I mean, I'm starting to memorize it because I'm listening to them through the walls, you know. So they're all screaming, they're hollering, you know, well, you know, uh, Uncle Junior, you're wrong. Hesh should be this and Tony should be that. They're screaming. Everyone is screaming. I said to myself, okay, I got it. So when it was, when it was time, they called me in the room and, is David Chase, who the hell knew who he was at the time? I didn't know who he was. Alan Taylor was the director of this particular episode, and then the producers were there, you know. So they said, are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. It was, you know, it was a couple of pages, maybe three. So what I did was, when the reader would give me the other characters' lines, what I did was I whispered my lines. I said, no, Tony, you're wrong. Junior's right. He's not going to get that. And that, now they're leaning over from their couches. What the fuck is he talking about? Can you hear him? I can't hear him. I figured if a guy has that much power, he's that dangerous. He doesn't have to scream at you. He can just very quietly tell you the way things are going to be, period. And it, I guess it worked. So the next morning I got a call. And uh, this my, my episode was only supposed to be one. Johnny Sack was only supposed to show up. But one episode, there was nothing written beyond that for him. So I did it. And, you know, it came out that January, whatever. And then I heard from them when they got to pick up for the second season. And then I think it was by the third, they made me a series regular. 
And uh, so we just built it up from there. That's so cool. Yeah, it was it was cool because it was something I was so reluctant to go to, to initially. I don't I don't know why. I just I wasn't feeling it. I didn't know what what this thing was going to be. You know, what does that mean? Sopranos? What? You know? I yeah. Just, and I up until that point, um, you know, were you aud- auditioning regularly or or were you just? No, 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 no. That's, just that's, whenever that's you're agent. I am so pragmatic. I'm so practical that I never wanted to really delve into this because. You know, I was either giving estimates to customers or I was running my crew or I was. It's the last thing you could tell me in those days was, listen, you know, go audition for acting roles somewhere on 13th Street. You know, it seats 20 people. No disparagement to anything or anyone who does that. I think it's wonderful, but I just didn't have the time or the desire. So when this came along and then it built for me, you know, starting the second season. Then I said to myself, okay, you know, I love the work, which I do love the work. I do love the work. And uh, we went on from there. And that, you know, that went into a lot of other things, you know. Well, how'd, you get, the, how'd you get started and, and even get to the point of, you know, getting an agent and, and doing all that stuff? To you? What happened was that um, I had read in Backstage Magazine years ago that Michael Moriarty, teaches acting in his apartment in Manhattan. Michael Moriarty was uh, the original star of Law and Order when it began, big, tall, Irish guy. He was uh, nominated for Best Supporting Actor with Clint Eastwood for Pale Rider. He had three Tony Awards. He had three Emmy Awards. The guy was prolific. Mm-hmm. And I was so reluctant to go to the first class because I, you know, like, what do you do when you go to an acting class? What, what do you do? Do you talk? Do you sit there? What, like, what do you do? I pushed myself to go. It was a Wednesday night, and he's got about 25 students in the room. Vince, Vince, how come you never give Irish people credit? Maureen made you go. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Your wife made made you go. go. Yeah, you didn't want to go. If it wasn't for the Irish, you never would have been in the show. You never would have been an actor. Okay, go ahead. All right. No, actually, you're right. She did push me. She said, Michael Moriarty teaches acting. You should go. Uh I said, okay. So, but I didn't, whatever. So I went, you're right about that. So it took me a few weeks before I opened my mouth. I didn't know what to say. I didn't have a monologue. I didn't have a scene. I didn't know anyone there. And I was there for two years. I went religiously every week for two years. And the man, the only thing that I took away from this class was how to breathe when you're working how not to do a big catch breath every time you deliver a line. He always said, you know, open up the top button of your, of your, of your jeans, uh, you know, loosen your belt. And when the time comes, you have dialogue, just talk. You got plenty of air in your system, in your stomach. It was a diaphragm thing with him. And I, I watched him do it many times. And he's very good. He was taught by, I don't know the guy's first name, Guthrie in some, theater I, in Minnesota back in the 50s or 60s. And he only came away with the one thing, how to breathe. Now you, Robert, you came into my acting workshop this past Saturday. I don't know if you heard me giving those notes about breathing. You yeah. may or may not have, I don't know. But what happened was I remembered that at my Sopranos callback. And I said to myself, I'm just going to breathe and talk, open my mouth and talk. If they like it, fine. If not, that's life. But I wasn't going to put on a patina of a gangster or anything. I, I, because I feel that's the worst thing you can do when you approach a character is to try to add layers to it. Just open up, talk. The director might say, a little louder, a little less, whatever. But as you go in, you go in from like zero. Just open your mouth, talk. So many people just stress themselves out. Well, I have I to like be this. That. I got to, you know, what did my character have for breakfast last Tuesday morning? Don't worry about it. Just if it's in the writing, if the writing is good, it's there. You just have to pick it up and chew on it and it'll come out. So I was there for a couple of years. Yeah. It sounds easy, you know, to say, remember to breathe, but I, you know, at least for me, when I, when I was doing scene work and stuff like that, it is, it's it's a lot harder than it sounds 
you know, breathing is something we do all day long. We don't think about it, but the second there's like lines and you've got to react to somebody, all of a sudden I'm thinking about everything else, like breathing or like yeah. what my face is doing. And it's such great advice because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we have the ability to do. It's just when we get in our head and we start thinking about it, um, it becomes like challenging now, you know, and challenging. Yeah, well, that's another thing, the thinking. That, that was one thing that Jimmy, God bless him, Jimmy always said, you know, we'd be sitting down into a scene, uh, stand, whatever it was, with, you know, like three or four other cast members. And he, I won't mention names. He would look at one of the actors and say, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. You know, before we go for the master shot. No, I'm fine. What's the matter? He said, you're thinking, aren't you? What I tell you all the time, don't think. When you hear action, just start to talk. Don't think. Because you're going you're gonna to block yourself somehow, some way. How am I going to say this? Is it going to sound right? Is it going to be convincing? That was a, one of the best notes I've ever heard from anyone. As far as a coach or an actor is, don't think. Just, you know, go. Just go. It'll, something will happen. Just go. So as far as the breath is concerned, every time I, you know, when I'm working, I play a judge a lot now on uh, special victims. And I always make it a point to begin whatever dialogue I have on the exhale. I find that when I exhale, then I can start to talk. If I, if I get prepared like this, you know, with a mm -hmm. lot of air in my diet, I'm like, ah, you know, is this something very false? not honest about that kind of work. Not grounded. So it's good to, yeah, you know, Jamie, you know, you just, you know, just. I love just, that. I love that so just much. Talk, just talk and don't think, man, just, because if you memorize, you're good. You know, that's your job. That's what they pay you for. They pay you to memorize it and they pay you to hopefully bring some type of a color to the. You, um, you know, it's so, it's so great that you say that about, uh, James Gandolfini or Jimmy, as you call him, because, you know, Jamie's also expressed. He had this ability to just kind of hone in and and uh, ask, you know, I remember you telling me, Jamie, that the time he was like, hey, what's what's wrong? You know, and like it was it was uh, it was after you were diagnosed with that mess and you were kind of carrying that secret mm -hmm. and it was just very clear to him. And he's you know, and I love hearing every guest that comes on has some some version of how James Gandolfini was not just like a giving actor, but just like a very caring person. And by caring for people, it made the work better and it made it, it opened up people and made them relaxed enough course, to not yeah. be so in their heads. And I don't know. I, I just don't know of a lot of, a lot of actors. No. And I'll no. tell you something, Cass, you know, you, you, Jim, God bless him, and due to his talent, became a, a major star. There's no question about it. But not just a star, an actor, a real actor who yeah. became a star. There's a difference, okay, between just publicity for people who mumble and people who actually do the work and do it well. And he did it extremely well and, and was iconic because of it, which, he, which was well-deserved. And I'll tell you something. You ever met these two persons will tell you no ego, no ego. There was nothing. There was nothing. No, no, he was not a prima donna. He wasn't this. He wasn't that. And certainly he could have been. But he wasn't. And so when you worked with him, 90 percent of my work was with Jim in the 30 some odd episodes that I shot. And I could tell, I would know that first moment, because we would, we would go like through seven pages, eight pages of dialogue. Just the two kept back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I could, I could read him like a book. I knew what mornings were going to be good, and I knew what nights on set were not going to be so good. Because he was honest, and it came out in his face. He could never he hide. Cares. Something was on Jimmy's mind, you knew it. I don't have to tell you, you guys worked with him certainly more than I did. But he was that honest that whatever he was going on came out in his. There were times when I mean, I'm six feet tall. Jim was taller. There were times when we'd be in the scene eye to eye standing. And all of a sudden he would just start like to get tall. And I'm saying, 
my eye lines off because I keep now I'm raising my head up to me. What happened just now? Like they jacked him up and he became, it would depend upon his, his portrayal of the character in that scene. Like you had always had to play catch with him. You didn't know, he would throw you stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, like, is he being real right now? Like, what is this? You know, but you had to keep going. Until you hear cut, you keep going. And What's we were never, ex- permitted, never permitted to improvise, of course, as we all know. So you had to just, you had to stay right on him. What's an example of, you know, you mentioned you, you could tell by looking at him a day was going to be good or a day was going to be a little more difficult. What's an example of a more difficult day? With Jim, a more difficult day would have been. You know, we had a lot of what they call company moves, where you would be on this location, and this entire circus would move. You know, twenty miles away, and that's stressful because you're waiting to work. You know, you you memorized, you got everything going, and you could see days when he would get very, very frustrated with the mechanics of this entire thing. You know, here's a guy probably shot for six hours straight. Okay, and now, oh, company move. You know, we're going to go someplace else now for. Nine hours, whatever. I mean, they worked him to death. They really did. They worked him to death. I, I shouldn't use that word. Forgive me. I, no, I imagine they worked, you know they worked him hard. Let's put he's got to he's got to carry the whole day, and then when he's off, he's got to go read the pages yeah. for the next day. I mean, that's exactly daunting. right. So when you got to those second parts of the day, and our two characters seem to have done that a lot, I said to myself, okay, you know what? I'm not going to talk to him. I'm going to let him rest. I'm going to let him relax. Because I, I hate to run lines. I'm, I'm one of the only actors you'll ever meet. I despise running lines. I either have it or I don't have it. I don't want to run lines because I might fuck you up. You know what I'm saying? So I would leave him up, but I could always tell what you would see that, you know, that tightness in him at the latter part of the day sometime. You know, oh, shit, what's going to happen? You know, but he was always ready. I mean, I've seen the guy take naps on the floor because he was exhausted. Mm. Jim, we're ready for it. And he's up. And he just goes right into Tony's surprise. It was amazing. I've never a- I've never witnessed anyone else that cared so much about the work. Like he uh, it really meant a lot to him. And if he didn't feel like he was giving his best, I think this is what kind of you're saying was a bad day. Like he would get frustrated no, with himself. Right. Never at anybody else. No. Like no really no. angry with himself because he took a lot of pride. Yeah. Not just for his performance, but I think for the show because he yeah. knew very much that the show was on his he carried the entire shoulders. thing, Jimmy yeah. and uh Jamie in in his heart. He carried the whole thing. He felt so responsible for us, mm-hmm. for the writers, for the producers, for everyone else. He felt responsible. I'm sure he, he did was, two seasons extra past what he wanted to do. Just yeah, oh yeah, us. without a doubt, exactly, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. But uh, he he was just you know he's the best acting lesson I ever had, and he didn't even realize he was teaching me anything. Mm. That's the truth. You know, I got along extremely well with him, but I knew when to. Uh, you know, I knew when to not talk. I knew when to not say, oh, Jim, is everything? I never said that because it's none of my business. You know, I would just sit down, wait for the shot, what's, whatever. But uh, I got to tell you a quick, uh, <laughs> we, we have time? Yeah. Okay. I got to tell you a quick story. There's a friend of mine, uh, David Budway. David Budway is a, Fabulous pianist. He's a pianist at the Cafe Carlisle in Manhattan, at the Bemelman Bar. They have two separate sides. Anyway, so he owns a jazz club in Nyack, New York, which is where I began the acting workshop a couple of years ago. So something happened. He wrote something to me. I don't know what it was. Something about his dog chewing on the rosary beads, little tiny puppy. So I didn't, I didn't know he was Catholic. He's Irish, but I didn't take it upon myself to, to, to know he was Catholic. So I wrote him back. I texted him back and said, David, you're Catholic? So this is what I get back from David Bugway. No, but we should be. What makes you ask? My family and I were part of a small sack in Naples called the Wild Waldensons from the 1700s, some kind of a half-assed Baptist cult. Some of my cousins and aunts and uncles are Catholic, but my mothers and my father and grandfather, they were socialists. They didn't care if their kids went to church at all. So they all went their separate ways, and my mother found her way to this Newark Baptist Church. Yay, yay. So I'm saying, well, what? what? What is this? 
I said, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. I heard about the rosary beads. I thought it was funny. By the way, Bucky Pizzarelli, jazz guitarist, is very ill. And uh, that was it. So I get back. What rosary story? I'm very son sorry, honestly, but who is Bucky? I realized that instead of texting David Budway, I texted David Chase. This is about a month and a half ago. And I get this big diatribe back about his family, what church they went to, they didn't go to. Yeah, we should have been capped. So he, I said, David, I'm sorry, uh, blah, 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 blah. He wrote, no problem, hope you're well. Sorry about your friend. Who's Bucky? I said, Bucky, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We went through this. I, those are the most words this man has said to me since <laughs> 1998. We never, never, there was never a conversation about any. He never came to me. Listen, Johnny Sachs should be this. Or he should, not a word. And I get this entire, I, he must have had a, like a lonely day. But I was stunned. I, I texted the wrong day. That's funny. Does that, it? does the fact that he didn't say much to you all these years as an actor, do you, do you wonder like, oh, does he like what I'm doing? Does he not? Do you like that he, he doesn't engage with you? Or um, is that, did, did you feel like maybe at any point that he's like, maybe this guy doesn't like me? What, what's that like when the creator of the show doesn't engage with you and you're on it for 33 episodes? <laughs> I think that a lot of it had to do with if you were okay, he wasn't going to say anything to you. You know, we had, we've had actors who came in, uh, maybe they, you know, they had a recurring role for like, I don't know, maybe two or three episodes. And I had one in particular say to me one day in front of the craft service table, you know, I just said good morning to Mr. Chase. And he, he like didn't even look at me. And he hasn't spoken to me in the last month that I've been here. Work. I said, you're blessed. David Chase doesn't say a word to you unless something traumatic is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you're good. Just keep your mouth shut. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I mean, if, if it wasn't good, how could you ever, how could you manage to be on the show for so long? I you think, know what? I think I'll that's tell you great. The truth. My, my feeling over all those years was really very simple. I believe that David is a writer's writer. I don't feel that David is an actor's writer. And I don't mean, I mean, he's done, it's phenomenal dialogue, phenomenal ideas. But I think he's the type of a showrunner, a writer and producer who says, OK, look, I wouldn't have hired you if I didn't think you could pull this off. So I'm going to leave you alone. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't a hands on director. I think he only directed a couple of them. I think that he felt confident that, OK, he's put all his elements together, his other writers, the directors, the actors, the cast. And let's see what happens. So I, him not talking to me was, was okay with me. Yeah, it was fine. Rob and Jamie, is that, I mean, did you guys experience the same thing with him or, or were you kind of, <laughs> did you have a different circumstance? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say we engaged much. I think early on, he, I remember after the college episode, he called my house to tell me that I did a good job, which like meant a lot. Yeah. Um, and there was a couple of times, maybe like in like the third season or fourth season when I had some big scenes here and there that he would give me a kudos. And maybe maybe there was an event here or there that we would like end up next to each other and have a conversation. But it was never it, it wasn't um, a, a close relationship, I would say, by yeah. any means. No, I felt like he was always uh, he loved you, Rob. He yeah. loves you. I felt like he was always really uh, nice to me, you know, and he yeah. did. He said a lot of really nice things to me, uh, especially like w when the show ended, like he just he he was always really uh, great. But it, it was rare. But I think that's what uh, I, I'm comfortable with, too. Like if, if you know, I think it's if somebody was like giving you compliments all the time, it's kind of uncomfortable. So I think like it was really nice when you know maybe once a season he would come and and give me a compliment or something like that it really felt like oh he means that you know he's not mm -hmm. just saying it because we happened to be staying next to each other or there was something to fill or this like he came and was like wow what you did there was really good or even one time like 
I forget if it was the Sopranos book or an interview or something, but he said like, out of nowhere, he just came over to me and he was like, you had the best line in the book, you know, or you had the best line in, in this whole, like if we did like a big long vanity fair, thing. I think it was the book and it was something like, you know, sometimes when I even just, I forget exactly what it was, but it was like talking about AJ and being like, I just want to, I just want to smack him, but it's me. Like, you know, like, I, or like some, something like that. And he was just like, oh, that was my favorite thing. Cause the funny thing was like, most people hated AJ and David Chase always said like, he couldn't understand why <laughs> you know? he's like, oh, he's just a kid. Like, you know, like he's, uh, you know, I like him. And then people were like, oh, we hate him. Maybe he represented him when he was young. Who knows? Could be. Could be. That, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned when he was young, he grew up in a garden apartment in Clifton, New Jersey. Real, uh, you know, working class town with his mother and father. So the episode where Johnny Sack, uh, I moved to New Jersey. Then another episode, I have a big house warming on my new place. So David happened to be on set that day, which, as you know, is rare. You know, he didn't come on set that often. And uh, Dominic is there, I mean, it's like most of the cast. And um, David turned to me. He said to me, um, your family was in the masonry business in New Jersey. I said, yeah. I said, then I went into my own, you know, years later and whatnot. He said, um, did they do a garden apartment in Clifton, New Jersey? It's a big project. I said, yeah, they did. Why? He mentioned the name of the complex. And then I mentioned to him the name of the big builder. He said, yeah, exactly. It's where I grew up. I said, my, my father did all the masonry. Wow. Dominic is off to the side saying, you know, my father used to get on a bus from the Bronx to come over to Jersey, he was a bricklayer, to work for CNC Curatola Corporation. I said, Dominic, are you fucking kidding me? So now we have my family did the thing he was living in. Dominic's father came over to help with a trowel on a level. And that's weird. So cool. That was really strange. How much work did, it sounds like your, your family had a pretty successful masonry business then. Right after World War II, yeah, yeah. But I, I, you know, I'm not the type to work for anyone. So when I was 19, I opened up my own little thing. Mm. What would your pops think of that? Uh, he wanted me to get out of it quickly. <laughs> yeah. He didn't want me in it at all. But when I did, um, my father was funny. My father was a lot like Jim's father. Um, and, 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 and Jamie and Robert will tell you, my father had no filter, you know, <laughs> him and Jim's father would be, you know, on the curb somewhere and his limousines pulling up. And he'd say to my, how much you think we should tip the limousine driver? <laughs> you know, I mean, those are the kind of guys they were, you know, but my father was extremely happy when, uh, when I, be, you know, I decided to hopefully act full time. You, you can make a decision to be a full-time actor. It's up to the business whether they're going to make you a full-time mm -hmm. actor. Yeah. But you have to have the drive and the desire. So when did you start your, your studio? Um, and what kind of prompted that? Well, the, uh, the acting workshop? Yeah, your, I'm sorry, your acting workshop. Yeah, yeah um, about two and a half years ago, I was, I was doing a performance in a club in Nyack, New York, which I'm in Jersey, but it's like right over the border. Um, uh, because I have a jazz band. I have a jazz group. Oh, okay. I have five jazz musicians, and I do a lot of Bobby Darren. I do a lot of, a uh, little bit of Sinatra, not too much. And thank God, I mean, these shows have been well received. And the owners of the place said, listen, you know, would you like to do something here? I said, you know, I would like to do something. And I think they thought I was going to say, you know, do a show every week or whatever. I thought, whatever. I said, I've been dying to have an acting workshop. You would? I said, yeah. And that was it from that moment on. And then they threw something up on Facebook. And I have these phenomenal people who come in. Now we're on Zoom, but we have like three or four classes a week because there are now 40 students. 
And it's wonderful because they're in close-ups for obvious reasons, and they're getting used to bringing it down, you know, not doing all this because there's no room. So now, we're, you know, we're getting to the eyes, and we're getting to the nuances. It, it's wonderful. I love it. I absolutely love it. What do you guys, is it mostly you, you give people scenes and they come and, and they prepare it and then they they'll, do They'll it. choose, you know, they'll choose scenes, but many times what I'll do for like maybe 20 minutes is I'll say something like, um, okay, it's just been on the news and it's on Twitter. It's all over the place that uh, there is a nuclear warhead headed to the mainland of the United States. We don't know if it's Iranian. We don't know if it's North Korean. They just put out the alert. Chances are, in about 20 minutes, we're gone. Go ahead. You see the reactions from different actors of how they would react to knowing that they can't call home. They are wherever they are. They can't hug someone because that one went out shopping. And that's an improv that I give them. And so much comes out of that. Who's laughing? Who's crying? Who's screaming? Who's consoling the other actor? You know, it, it's just amazing. What, and they put themselves through it. And that's a warm up. And then they can be, you know, there's scenes they usually choose on their own. Um, and we work. You know, I'm a stop and go coach. You know, if I get a ring in my ear that, you know, that just didn't sound, I don't care if it sounded right. I just want it to be honest. So if it sounds honest, I'll let them keep going. But uh, like I said, Robert was in for about 15, 20 minutes on one of the classes last Saturday. I do beat them up, Robert. So I guess you got to admit that. But, well, you know what? I don't know if you remember, but that wasn't the first time you asked me to come say hi to your acting class. Do you remember the first time? It was a person class? It was a long time ago. Yeah, you. Oh, that was in part. Right, right, right. When yeah, we gathered, were, right. You were teaching an acting class with Michael Imperioli and Sharon Angela. Oh, back at Studio Dante. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Yeah, that's a long time ago. What was going on there? That was, uh, that was heavy. I mean, we had just done a play called Baptism by Fire that Michael directed me in. Wonderful, original play, fabulous. And so, I mean, the thing was, I, I think it ran four nights a week for a month. It was sold out. I mean, it was the, the writer, John Dapolito from Manhattan, was an incredible writer. So the night, that it the night that it closed, I stayed up on the stage. I'm trying to decompress. And they had these magnificent double doors that went out to the, to the lobby of the little theater that Michael built. So Michael came in. He brought me a drink. He closed the door. He said, how do you feel? I said, I, I wasted because it was a, it was a, it was a real piece of work. This thing it really was. My son blows his brains out on stage. It was tough. I said, Michael, I have an idea. He said, What is it? I said, We should have an acting studio. What? I said, Well, you have all the room. You have this. You have that. He said, Hold on, I'll be right back. He goes back out into the lobby. He talks to his wife Victoria. He comes back in and says, Let's do it. We put the thing in backstage, and it went like boom. And, and the only reason it ended three years later is because he sold the he sold the building. It was the, so the, that was back in the O's, you know. So this thing has been in my mind all this time, and so now we and and I have a, I have a separate cast that's been rehearsing Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross for the last two months. Those are separate guys, separate students. You know, it's funny because when you were talking about how David Chase was a writer's writer and maybe not an actor's writer, I immediately yeah. thought of David Mamet and and I was trying to think, I'm like, is he a writer's writer or an actor's writer? Because he's got this very distinct staccato sort of style when he's writing and it's fun as an actor, yeah. but it's harder. Is But also as a writer, he's pretty prolific. I mean, what where do you think David Mamet falls into that? Mamet, Mamet gives you great stuff to chew on, you know, where he'll take a word like, uh, you know, they'll say in Glenn Garrigan, I don't believe it. They stole the leads. They stole the phones. They stole the phones. I just told you the phones are gone. I can't believe they stole the phones. What are we supposed to do without phone? Now you listen to this word phone 15 times. 
And we've only gone down a half a page so far, but that's Mammoth. He locks onto a word and he makes sure that you remember that subject matter because he, he makes you repeat it and repeat. And it sounds, it does to me sound like real life because, you know, my wife could say something to me like, you want iced tea? You want lemonade? I'll have iced tea. You sure you want the iced tea? Because I just made the lemonade. <laughs> no, I really like to have the iced tea. I think you're drinking too much. Now we're talking about iced tea for five minutes. Let's go on to another word, but that's mammoth. That's how he writes. American Buffalo. Uh, incredible. You know. um, where do people go if they want to take your workshop? And do you just accept anyone or do you, is there like a process to get in? I and- have them. I have uh, actually, I just picked up two students from London, uh, one from somewhere in France, so across the United States. What they do is um, it, it comes up on Facebook and then there's an email. And then what they'll uh, they'll do is they'll text or whatever, and I, I, I get a little background from them, you know, because I want to make sure that it, this is not about they want to meet Johnny Sack from The Sopranos, you know what I'm saying? And you all go through that, no, no matter where you go, you know, why is somebody saying, being nice to me? You wonder sometimes, you know, you hope it's sincere. Oh, yeah, what's the email? Go ahead. Uh, this is it, Maureen. <laughs> Vincent Kiritola acting workshop at gmail.com. Awesome. So you like, I feel like you talked about construction and acting and then, but I feel like you found your true calling when you became a grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have two little ones, Blake and Grayson, two little brothers. They're 11 and eight and uh, they look very Irish, Robert. They have strawberry blonde hair and they're very sweet. They're very chicken they're breast very, very, skin. Very, huh? Raw chicken breast colored skin. Yeah, right, right. Close to that. You're right. And uh, they're just very humble, extreme. And I love them. I mean, you know, it's like when that happens, it's not about you anymore. You know, you don't want to go out and spend a hundred grand on something. You go, no, I got two grandsons now. You know, let me... Uh, let me get ready for them. It's it's their time now. They're, they're wonderful little guys. Maureen she left. She, my wife left me. They uh, you uh, like uh, before we let you go. I wanted to because you've known Tony Sirico forever. I'm sorry. I said before we let you go. You've known Tony Sirico forever. Correct. Uh, before Sopranos, before everything, everybody he's everybody's favorite. You know, he was our favorite yep. to watch around the set. Everything. Can you give us your best Tony Sirico? <laughs> story <laughs> okay yeah, i gotta tell you there's so many but i'm gonna pick one out in the interest of time um you could give us two if they're short and good whatever yeah you want. They're, 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 they're okay uh i'll give you I'll, I'll give you two quick ones the first one was he called he called my house on a saturday night about six o'clock he had terrible stomach pain this is before sopranos before okay very bad stomach pain he actually thought he was dying Dude, where's Maureen? Put her on the phone. Maureen, Tony Sirico wants to talk to you. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Maureen, my stomach, but it, but I don't know. It could be a heart attack. Maybe it's, a, I don't know what the problem. I, I got to go to the hospital. She said, Tony, you better get to the hospital in Brooklyn. I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm dying. Tony, hang up the phone. Go to the hospital, right? So this is six o'clock at night. I'm figuring... Well, if I don't hear back from him tonight, could be one of two things. He's fine or he died. One of the two. <laughs> so Sunday morning, I'm saying to myself, you know, what happened to this guy? He called. He was in a panic. He was supposed to call us back. So I called him 11 o'clock Sunday morning. I said, Tony, what happened? You're home? Okay. Because we you know, wouldn't have a cell phone. Yeah, I'm home. He said, I, I got to the hospital last night at midnight. Tony. You called at six o'clock. You sounded like you were on your way to leave this planet. What happened? Oh, no. I couldn't go right away. I had to get my hair ready. I had to do my hair. You know, he used to wash his hair. You know the story. Wash his hair. Dry it a little bit. Sit in front of the towels. You wait a little while. Take the towel. Dry it a little Because he wants to build up the pompadour. Then he puts whatever in it. And he used to save them a hell of a lot of time because when he came into hair and makeup, you never had to do his hair, only his makeup. He would, nobody could touch his hair. 
So that was that story. The other one was we were at Stinking Gardeners here. We were at the Peninsula, no, we were at the Four Seasons Hotel, for one of the SAG Award things. Maureen stayed home, I went out. And so Tony and I are sitting at a table right near the bar. And, um, you know, with Mike Sullivan, Tony's friend, a lot of other people. So, you know, when you're sitting down somewhere, Jamie, and you just feel like a vulture standing over you, but you don't know who the hell or what it is. And you're like, you don't really want to look, but you look, and you know. So I saw this guy standing there, and I recognized him right away. He was the former prime minister of Great Britain, John Major. I said, oh, shit, look at this. And he's looking at me, and he's smiling, and he's putting his hand out, you know. And I got up. I said, hello, Mr. Prime Minister. He says, I love your show. I love it. Thank you. Brother. He's got two bodyguards with him, you know. So with that, he's kind of looking over my shoulder at Tony. Tony's not acknowledging him. So I said, uh, I leaned down to Tony. I said, Tony, uh, this is the former Prime Minister John Major from Great Britain. He wants to say hello to you. Tony looks up. Yeah, he looks like him. And he keeps talking to Mike Sullivan. <laughs> Tony, Tony, this is, this. he wants to say hello to you. Could you just get up for a minute, shake his hand? What the fuck are you bothering me, Paul? Yeah, yeah, you look like that guy. I've seen him on television. <laughs> he sits down again. Finally, I really gave him a shot. And then Mike Sullivan said, Tony, that's the prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. He got up and totally then everything was fine. I mean, he's got a head like a rock. You can't convince him of anything. I love he's, him so much. Oh, he's incredible. Okay, hang on. Oh, wait. Give it back to me. <laughs> oh, shit. Hold on, guys. 38 years, Maureen, from all of us, we're sorry. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> really, you're <Yeah>. just... <laughs> An angel. Are those the boys? Yes. So handsome. Two little Irish kids. Anyway, that's the story. Well, my my favorite, uh, real quick, my favorite uh, Tony Sirico story, we were at a charity thing, and there's hundreds of people. It was like one of those hard share things that we would do. There's hundreds of people in a room. And there's somebody up on stage making a speech and it's quiet in the room and you hear him going, Oh, Oh, and he's like snapping and he's doing the thing. So like slowly everyone starts to turn and they're, and, and everyone's looking at him, hundreds of people and he's, Oh, and he's getting the attention of one of the people going around to the tables, pouring wine, like three tables away from him. And so finally somebody at that table taps that person who's given the wine, they look over with the bottle and he goes like this, get over here. So they walk over, everybody's watching, everyone's looking at like, what's going on? <laughs> Tony Strico doesn't say a word to this person. He takes his two fingers like this and he points to his wine glass, like <laughs> fill it up. So the person just starts like filling up the, the wine glass and right when they got about three quarters of the way up, he just went like this. And he like <laughs> burned his turn the faucet off. Outward, you know? And the person stopped pouring, and Tony Sirico grabbed the cup and looked back up to the person on stage speaking. And it was you No, know, you mentioned you mentioned wine. One night, Emmys, <laughs> the night before Brad Gray had all of us to his mm -hmm. home in the hills, yeah. remember? And he's sending multiple limousines to the hotel, pick us all up. He's gonna have a party for us, whatever. We get out of the limo and Sirico happened to be in the car with Mike Sullivan, Maureen and I in the one car. We get out of the car. We're walking this massive driveway and lawn up to one of the portable bars Brad Gray had set up. And there's a bartender there. Oh, hello, Mr. Sirico. How are you? Hello, Mr. Kiratol. Yes, fine. Thank you. Tony said, uh, so Brad Gray standing right there. Tony said, uh, you got a Santa Margarita, Pina Grigia? <laughs> yes, Mr. Sirico, we have it. Hold on, let me get your glass. Don't be giving me the stuff from under the bar. You're telling me it's Santa Margarita. I want the real fucking one. Brad Gray, standing like Brad Gray's going to pinch pennies now. Get the cheap Santa right, Margarita, right, you know what right. I mean? I said, Tony, stop. He was dead serious. <laughs> he says, how do I know what this guy's really going to get? Tony, shut up. Just shut up. It works when you shut up. Oh, he's amazing. 
No, no. They're, they're coming around with plates of caviar and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Santa yeah. Margarita. Canapes. Canapes. So do you Bloody tell stuff. us, tell people one more time where, what the email is, if they want to do the acting class. It's uh, the acting workshop with what? Vincent Curatola acting workshop. At Gmail. At Gmail. <laughs> and you're on Twitter and Instagram too, right? Yes, I am. Yes. Twitter and Instagram. What What's your... Oh, just... Twitter is at Vincent Curatola. No spaces. Instagram is Vince underscore Curatola. Love it. It was great meeting you. Thanks so Love much. You, for coming on. Love you too. Love you, Vince. Thank you so God much. Bless you. Thank you. I appreciate it. To you guys Bye, next time. Remember, you can follow us at Pajama Pants on uh, Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We just broke 10,000, right? See? It's fucking great. Thanks so much. And um, we will uh, be back next week, same time. What do you say? Uh, I'll right. see ya. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>